Hello everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Evolution of Standardization in Laboratory Medicine. I am Dietmar Stöckel, and on behalf of Siemens Healthcare, I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's webcast is presented by labroots.com, the leading social media site for science professionals and sponsored by Siemens Healthcare. Siemens Healthcare is one of the world's largest suppliers of medical infrastructure and is a leader in medical imaging, laboratory diagnostics, and clinical IT. For more information, please visit www.siemens.com slash healthcare. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We will try to answer as many questions as we can. Further, you can enlarge your slide screen by clicking on the icon at the right-hand corner of the slide window, the lower right corner. If you would have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button, which is on the top right of your presentation window, or submit your problem through the green Q&A button on the lower left. So now I would like to introduce today's speaker, Professor Dr. Linda Timpont. She is Professor Emeritus of Analytical Chemistry, Statistics and Quality Control, Method Development and Validation. She is also former director of the Laboratory for Analytical Chemistry, IDMS Reference Laboratory at the University of Ghent in Belgium. And Professor Timpon has spent most of her career developing and validating reference measurement procedures using isotope dilution gas chromatography and liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. And this for the analysis of many components in serum and plasma. These have included clinical chemistry analytes, steroid hormones, thyroid hormones, peptides and vitamin metabolites. By establishing metrological traceability and assessing the trueness and accuracy of hierarchically lower methods, the routine methods, in laboratory medicine, she has worked with the eminent standardization and certification authorities. In addition to chairing the IFCC Committee on Standardization of Thyroid Hormones. She has also worked in research projects with different IVD manufacturers worldwide and been involved in proficiency testing slash external quality assessment. She worked with accreditation bodies and governmental organizations. So uh, this was the introduction from my side. I would like to hand it over now to Linda. Please, Linda. Thank you, Dietmar, for this kind introduction. And I also want to welcome all of you who logged in for attending this live webinar. And as I said before, I will present on the evolution of standardization in laboratory medicine. Before I start, I want to make a declaration of interest. I receive consultancy and speaker's fees from two companies, from Tozo and Siemens. So we can start now, and I can tell you that I constructed my presentation in such a way that after this session, you participants will be able to identify 
the rationale for standardization in laboratory medicine and the benefit thereof, to describe the basic design of the standardization process and its evolution, to learn the importance of using panels of clinically relevant samples in the standardization process, to identify the requirements to be met before standardization can be implemented in practice, and to understand what is required after standardization. And I start with a first question. Where does standardization stand for? Well, it is a process intended to accomplish reasonable comparability and or interchangeability of results produced by different measurement procedures. And in practice, the process comes down to establishing so-called metrological traceability to internationally agreed measurement standards. The next question, why do we need standardization in laboratory medicine? Well, this is because our discipline faces the problem that different IVD tests give different results. And actually, that problem was recognized very early in the history of laboratory medicine by people whom I call in this slide the naggers. And I refer first to Kali, who observed already in 1973 that there was a pro problem and who published in clinical chemistry an ID whose time has come. That ID was trueness and accuracy of measurement. Then, a decade later, there was Titz, who published again in the same journal, Accuracy in Clinical Chemistry, Does Anybody Care? So apparently, after the call by Kali, nothing spectacular happened. And I call myself also an agger, since I refer here in this slide to a publication from 2008 with the title Accuracy in Clinical Chemistry, Who Will Kiss Sleeping Beauty Awake? Well, in that publication, I informed the clinical community that, in fact, all the tools were available to establish metrological traceability, but that it was time to make use of them. And, of course, all those calls were driven by the conviction that laboratory medicine data should be such that they allow correct diagnosis of disease, therapy and patient monitoring, for which we need standardization or establishment of metrological traceability. The benefit of working with standardized assays is that they are fit to address modern clinical and public health needs such as that laboratory data should have absolute clinical utility with unconditional safety for the patient. They should also allow applicability of consistent standards of medical care, which require the use of common clinical decision limits, the possibility to develop and use evidence-based clinical practice guidelines, also, the possibility to aggregate data from several uh, studies, research studies, so that research can be translated into patient care and disease prevention activities. And in an era where the mobility of patients is huge and where the patient has the habit to go for a second or even third opinion, interchangeability of laboratory results is of utmost importance so that they can be part of electronic patient records. The next question. I return to metrological traceability and let us look how it is defined. Well, in this regard, I refer to the International Vocabulary of Metrology, abbreviated as the VIM, from the ISO. The VIM comprises the basic and general concepts of metrology and associated terms. It's really the Bible of our discipline. Well, under 2.41, metrological traceability is defined as the property of a measurement result 
whereby the result can be related to a reference through a documented unbroken chain of calibrations. There is a note to clarify what a reference is. Well, it can be a definition of a measurement unit through its practical realization, or a measurement procedure, or a measurement standard. There is also a note that refers to the fact that sometimes meteorological traceability is simply abbreviated to traceability. I do not know whether those definitions help you a lot, but let us continue and let us look into the anchors of meteorological traceability. And you may wonder how broad the array of anchors is. I start with the first one, the metric anchor. Well, you should know that in former times, several metric units were in use to communicate on measurements in various disciplines. However, there was no real coordination. And this was a motivation first for the meter convention and later on for the Conférence Générale des Poids et des Mesures to develop and agree on a coherent measurement system the so-called Système International d'Unité, or SI unit system. Well, this unit system was intended to communicate in a standardized manner on measurements all over the world. The IFCC also adopted that unit basis, and as you know, in our discipline, the mole is the SI base. The mole stands for the amount of substance or the mole per liter, the derived unit for the amount of substance concentration. The next anchor is the measurement anchor. And here I refer again to the VIM, where a measurement is defined as the process of experimentally obtaining quantity values that can reasonably be attributed to a quantity. And you should know that a particular quantity requires specification of three elements, being the system, the component, and the kind of quantity. For example, the plasma for the system, glucose for the component, and the amount of substance concentration for the kind of quantity. In the VIM, a particular quantity subject to measurement is called the measurant. And now, very important is to know that in the VIM, the quantity is defined, the measurant, better said, is defined as the quantity intended to be measured. Not the quantity that we measure, but intended to be measured for the diagnostic application. The next anchor is the meteorological concept anchor. And in this regard, I go back to Kali and Titz. Indeed, in answer to the call by Kali, Titz proposed a model for a comprehensive measurement system in clinical chemistry. That was, of course, the precursor of what we know today as reference measurement system. And it was the intention to use that model as a calibration hierarchy. And with the aid of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, TITS began to give that model shape in the United States, but very soon there were also several activities in Europe in this regard. There is, of course, also a regulatory anchor, and in Europe it is laid down by the directive published in 1998, demanding that manufacturers demonstrate the meteorological traceability of their in vitro diagnostic medical devices before they can receive CE marking. In the US, you have, of course, the FDA regulation, the 510K clearance, and apparently that regulation moves more and more from the predicate device to the traceable device. And it is a fact that other countries, as those listed in, listed in this slide, uh, seem to follow that trend. Of course, legislation prescribes certain requirements, but never tells how those requirements should be met. Well, for this, we have the global ISO anchor, laid down in several ISO standards. And I start with the ISO 17511, which recommends that for establishment of meteorological traceability, a reference measurement system should be used. You heard that I said recommend 
Indeed, these standards are not compulsory for the IVD industry, but they know that by using them, they will comply with legislation. With regard to the requirements of the key elements of the reference measurement system, I mean the reference measurement procedures, materials and reference measurement laboratories, well, there is another ISO standard series, the 15193 through 195, where they are described. And I show you here a flow chart demonstrating how the reference measurement system looks like and you will immediately recognize certain anchors that we discussed before. At the top you see the measurement and the units for expression of measurement results. At the level below you see the unit realization in a crystalline material certified for its purity. And then the reference measurement system consists of a combination of materials and measurement procedures. And the combination is in such a way that the material always is used to calibrate a measurement procedure and the latter is used to assign values to the material or calibrator at the level below. <coughs> Excuse me. So by applying that reference measurement system in an unbroken way, one comes at the bottom that a result produced for a patient sample by a calibrated routine assay is traceable to the SI, of course within the constraints of measurement uncertainty generated at each level of measurement. In this slide you see the different organizations responsible for the key elements of the hierarchically higher part of the reference measurement system. These are the CGPM for the establishment of the coherent uh, unit system, the IFCC for the definition of the relevant uh, uh, component in the measurement, the National Metrology Institutes for the production and certification of reference materials, reference laboratories or whatever competent analytical laboratories for the development and validation of reference measurement procedures, and those laboratories preferably work under network conditions to apply reference measurement procedures either for the establishment or assessment of meteorological traceability. And to close now the circle of the anchors, I refer to the Joint Committee for Traceability and Laboratory Medicine, which is an organization that has in fact the overarching control of the key elements of the reference measurement system. Indeed, they have a procedure in place to verify that uh, claimed reference measurement procedures, materials and laboratories are conform with the aforementioned ISO standards and when they are, they are listed in the database which is available, publicly available for potential users. So now that we have seen the theory of meteorological traceability, the rationale for establishing it, the concepts and the anchors and the reference measurement system, can we now safely say that the theory was capable to warrant that meteorological traceability was established in our discipline? Well, personally, when I entered as young scientist, the uh, clinical chemistry, I thought that establishing meteorological traceability would be a fast-flowing river, easily overcoming obstacles. Indeed, I thought that by developing one after the other reference measurement procedure, industry would welcome that finally they got the key to establishing traceability and doing so would become the evidence itself. You see here all the reference measurement procedures I developed throughout my career. However, getting older, I had to observe that obstacles may cause the river to meander and slow down. Indeed, I realized that there was the age-old tension between theory and practice, and for myself and other colleagues working in the field, it took some time before we realized that 
as nice a theory can be, it must find its way into practice because it has value. And you can believe me, finding that way into practice was very difficult. And I can illustrate this maybe by the most striking example, that of insulin measurement. As you know, as early as 1959, Yellow and Burson developed the first insulin immunoassay for measurement in plasma. That was really the basis for laboratory medicine in endocrinology. It even led to the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1977 for Rosalind Yellow. Well, can you understand that more than half a decade after that invention, insulin assays still are not standardized? Well, this was because there were several obstacles causing problems to establishing metrological traceability. However, luckily, there was an evolution towards solving those problems. And that's what I'm going to deal with you now in, my, in the rest of my presentation. Well, the obstacles that were encountered in the beginning were coming from insufficient attention to the definition of the component or analyte in the measurement and related aspects. And I will illustrate this for SI and non-SI analytes. There was also insufficient attention to the validity of reference materials and reference measurement procedures, to the potential non-commutability of reference materials and the importance of panels of native samples. So insufficient attention was paid to the intrinsic quality of the assays examined for standardization and the extent of standardization to achieve. But as I said before, there was an evolution towards solving the problems. And I start with the first obstacle, insufficient definition of the component or analyte in the measurement. And I would like to recall that the measurement is the basis of the reference measurement system, that it is defined as the quantity intended to be measured for the um, the, the diagnostic application. It requires specification of three, anal three elements, the component or the analyte, the kind of quantity and the system. And the definition of the measurement is determining for the reference measurement procedure and its specificity. Well, it is very important that before attempting to develop a reference measurement system that there is a univocal definition of the measurement and that there is a general agreement definition that cannot be sufficiently emphasized. And it's also important that certain conceptual aspects related to the definition are respected. Well, I will exemplify this by way of SI analytes. SI analytes are those that are physico-chemically well-defined. For example, when we speak of tyroxine and serum and plasma, everyone knows that tyroxine is chemically well-defined. We exactly know the chemical structure. Well, the definition of the component in the measurement for tyroxine is absolutely unproblematic. I go now to a next example, that of total 25-hydroxyvitamin D, which might be a little bit com more complicated. And the reason for this is that, in fact, the term total refers to the fact that we speak of mixture analysis. Indeed, total 25-hydroxyvitamin D is defined as 25-hydroxy-D2 and D3 with exclusion of the three epiforms of the two metabolites. Again, the two metabolites are chemically well-defined, however, the difficulty is in the fact that we had to add up the measurements for the two molecules. 
And when I said before that certain conceptual aspects related to the definition need to be respected, I can exemplify this for total 25 hydroxy D analysis. Indeed, the definition of the measurement requires that routine immunoassays are capable to equimolar measurements of the mixture components 25 hydroxy D2 and D3. So the accent is on equimolar measurement. Since we have to add up the measurement results for the D2 and D3 metabolite, we have to express measurement results in nanomol per liter, which is not interchangeable with nanogram per ml. Logically not, because the two molecules have a different molecular weight. And since the three epiforms are excluded from the definition of the measurement, there is the requirement that the routine assays have sufficient specificity to not measure the three epiform. That means immunoassays should not cross-react with the three epiform and routine MS methods must have sufficient chromatographic resolution to resolve the epiform. Another obstacle, as I said, was that insufficient attention was paid to the validity of reference measurement procedures and reference materials. Indeed, reference materials must uh, comprise the defined components in the measurement, and the reference measurement procedure must be specific and capable of accurate measurement of the uh, component in the measurement. Well, beforehand, there was no mechanism in place to verify that a reference material and reference measurement procedure really was a valid one. I can exemplify this, for example, for organic analytes. It was thought in the beginning that whatever IDMS method would serve the purpose of a reference measurement procedure because of the potential of MS to accurate and specific measurement. However, this was a misunderstanding because an IDMS method must have a certain quality, must have a certain specificity and quality of performance before it can be claimed to be a reference measurement procedure. Thus, the designer of the method has to develop that method towards that quality, but finally has to prove that the quality is there by a thorough validation. Well, luckily, the evolution is in the fact that we have now the JCTLM database to warrant the validity of the listed reference materials and measurement procedures. I now go to the definition of the component in the measurement for non-SI analytes. And you see here a very nice iceberg and you see that the SI analytes only are the tip of the iceberg. All the other analytes that we determine in our discipline are so-called non-SI analytes. Those are analytes that either are not defined yet or not well defined, thus for which we cannot apply SI units. Instead, we have to apply arbitrary units, the non-SI units, as, for example, defined by the WHO. And most of those analytes are heterogeneous analytes. I refer, for example, to tumor and bone and cardiac markers, to all the proteins that have been elucidated through protein uh, projects and new markers like cytokinins and growth hormones. And I will illustrate the problem of defining the component or analyte in the measurement for thyroid stimulating hormone. That is a glycoprotein that is heterogeneous. Thus, when we measure TSH and serum or plasma, we know that we do not measure one molecule, but a family of molecules. Thus, we speak about mixture analysis. Indeed, TSH comprises two non-covalently linked subunits, an alpha and a beta subunit. The alpha subunit is common to all the glycoproteins. The beta is specific for TSH. And both subunits comprise a certain amount of amino acids in a certain sequence and also carbohydrate change. 
Well, the heterogeneity for TSH is in the amino acid sequence and the isoforms, but also in the glycosylation pattern, as shown in literature, that glycosylation pattern is disease-specific. So no wonder that it is difficult to define the component in the measurement. When we look in, the, in practice with regard to mixture analysis for TSH, well, we observe that all immunoassays claim that they measure the amount of substance concentration of human TSH and serum and plasma. As I said before, we know that we measure a family of components and until recently that family of components was not yet formally defined. And we express measurement results in arbitrary units, the milli international units per liter, as defined by the WHO International Reference Preparation, the TSH 80-558 or 81-565 to exactly the same materials. But we should also realize that, in fact, TSH is a component in transition from S, non-SI to SI unit. Indeed, one day it will maybe be possible to measure a disease-specific TSH and to develop a reference measurement procedure for it. Thus, then, we will also be able to express measurement results in SI units. Of course, as long as we have to do with a non-SI analyte, it is the question, should we already attempt to standardize or not yet? Well, in this regard, I would like to recall that before we answer that question, we have to be sure what do we intend to measure. And in this regard, I would like to refer to Roger Eakins, who is a very estimated scientist because of his pioneering work in the 60s with regard to the development of methods for ligand uh, uh, measurement for hormones and free hormones. And when he was asked that question, what do we intend to measure in case of mixture analysis, his reply was at least surprising, since he said, Insofar as the antigenic substances present in standards or test samples are molecularly heterogeneous, an immunoassay is invalid. Hence, any attempt to standardize analytically invalid immunoassays will inevitably fail. That was Eakins the purist. However, Eakins was a very intellectual man. He could also be a pragmatist, since in the same publication he continued it is nevertheless possible to visualize circumstances in which an assay system, though analytically invalid in the strictest sense, responds only to a particular atomic group common to the molecules or of substances differing in overall structures. And he even referred to TSH. In other words, that's saying that there might be a pragmatic solution for immunoassays that recognize epitopes at invariate peptide sequences. Well, in this regard, I would like now to refer to a proposal by an IFCC committee for standardization of thyroid function tests, of which I am the chairholder. Indeed, we proposed that TSH assays could be harmonized instead of standardized. What's the difference between harmonization and standardization? Well, in fact, both processes aim at the same objective, to make assays comparable. However, harmonization is a pragmatic approach, standardization is a pure metrological approach. So we see harmonization as an intermediary solution until SI units are possible, until a reference measurement procedure is available. And the committee defined the component as human TSH, the intact form, the total form, with glycosylation encountered in a diagnostic application which should be specified, for example, TSH for the diagnosis of uncomplicated hypo versus hyperthyroidism or euthyroidism. We also propose to make use of a surrogate reference measurement procedure 
we referred to the use of a statistical all procedure TREB mean from a method comparison with a clinically relevant panel and participation of as many assays as possible. I show you here the proof of concept of harmonization and I do it by way of TSH. So we performed a method comparison with 16 immunoassays and you see at the left hand a presentation of the percentage difference of the results by all the immunoassays for a panel of samples. You see that I give the most discrepant assays different uh, uh, colors, the blue symbols and the red triangles. And you see that before the harmonization process, the differences, there are differences between the immunoassays. But after the harmonization process, you see that the interassay differences are eliminated, that the percentage assay residuals are nicely centered around zero and that the remaining dispersion is from within assay effects. I move now to another obstacle and that obstacle was that in the first beginning they always tried to accomplish standardization by use of a reference material dissolved in an artificial matrix. Well in this regard you should know that a reference material always is to a certain extent processed. For example, the TSH reference material that I mentioned before is purified cadaver pituitary. Well, because of this, a reference material is not suited for standardization. However, the problem is that it was not realized that this was a fact. And I show you again for TSH that in fact, of the, in spite of the fact that all assays are traceable to the same reference material, the WHO, when they measure the same panel of samples and we plot the mean for each of the assays, you see that they are apart from each other and the most discrepant assays give a mean that is at 163 and at 2.26. So quite a difference, more than 30%. So in spite of the fact that they are all are calibrated with the same reference material, they do not give comparable results. You may wonder how that comes. Well, this is because reference materials are so-called so non-commutable. That's again a meteorological term, but in layperson terms that means that a reference material does not behave with a routine assay as native samples do. And of course the behavior of native samples are the reference because any routine assay is developed for optimal measurement of a native sample. And you see here in this graph a presentation of the mathematical relationship between the results by a reference measurement procedure in the abscess and a routine assay in the ordinate. And you see that mathematical relationship for clinical samples, that's what you see in the black symbols, and for three reference materials, these are the red symbols. And you immediately see that the reference materials have another mathematical relationship between the two measurement procedures than the native samples. So apparently the dose response with the routine assays is different for the reference materials than for the component in its natural environment, serum or plasma. Luckily, there was an evolution in that it was found how to overcome that issue of non-commutability and the solution is in the use of panels of native samples in the reference measurement system at the level of the working calibrator. So that is absolutely permissible in the ISO 17511. And I, in this regard, I would like to bring tribute to a Swedish colleague, Ingmar Björkem, who was the first one to speak about the issue of non-commutability of reference materials if used for calibration of immunoassays and he exemplified that by way of a cortisol immunoassay. And his solution was, 
to use native samples assigned with values by reference measurement procedure instead of reference materials. Well, I can tell you when I entered the field half a decade later, I took Bjorkem as my big example and in this way I came, became maybe one of the biggest protagonists of the use of native samples in the standardization process. I show you here again the proof of concept for use of serum panels. I show you another example of the CSTFT 3T4. Here the method comparison was done against a reference measurement procedure and you see that before the standardization all the immunoassays had a, strongly, a strong negative bias in comparison to the reference method and they also were apart from each other. Well, after standardization on the basis of that panel of native samples, you see that the bias to the reference measurement procedure is completely uh, removed and that again the residual dispersion is nearly entirely due to within assay effects. Another obstacle I mentioned before was insufficient attention to the intrinsic quality of the assays examined for standardization. Well, luckily there is now the evolution that recent projects perform a method comparison and apply a me measurement protocol so that they can infer the general performance attributes of the assays examined for standardization. It's very important to also know the attributes on native samples. In addition, the evolution is such that it is more and more realized that standardization only emphasizes the average result and never looks into the quality of performance on the, at the level of the individual sample. Well, therefore, recent projects now used to look into the total error performance and evaluate the total error against specifications, for example, those based on a biological variation model. For example, again, my CSTFT group looks into the total error. I show you here the example for 3T4. We use as a total error specification those based on the biological variation, being 9.6%. And after the method comparison, we recalibrate the data to the uh, reference measurement procedure and we plot the differences. And we include in the plot also the specifications for total error. And in this plot, we then can visually show the intrinsic quality of the assays in terms of uh, the total error by looking into the number of differences outside the specifications. For example, at the left hand, I show you an assay that has a very good intrinsic quality, only one difference is outside the total error specification. At the right hand, in contrast, you see an assay with a poor intrinsic quality, several differences are outside the total error specification. This means when that assay is standardized, in average, the result will be okay, but at the level of the individual sample, the uncertainty will be huge. Another obstacle in the beginning was insufficient attention to the extent of traceability. Luckily, there is now the evolution that recent projects first set the specifications to achieve by the standardization projects. And in this regard, my group did, I think, very nice work by defining the specifications for the 25-hydroxy reference measurement system. Those specifications and that model was adopted by the CDC and the vitamin D standardization program. And the approach was such that we started by setting specifications for the routine methods in terms of imprecision and bias. And we then cascaded down those specifications to come to the specifications for the reference measurement procedure. And we said the imprecision should be such that it is only half the imprecision permissible for the routine method and the bias should be only one-third the bias allowable for the routine method. 
and the same cascading down for the uncertainty of the primary calibrator, which should only consume one-third of the budget for the bias of the reference measurement procedure. So now the question, after establishment of meteorological traceability, can, be, can it be implemented from one day to another? Well, certainly the answer is no, that is not possible. The implementation needs to be carefully prepared, in particular where, when the impact of standardization is huge. And for example, for 3 d 4 that impact will be huge. You see here that the numerical values of, provided by the immunoassays of the standardization will increase by 50 to 80%. That also means that the reference intervals will change. Well, that impact will, in fact, be a high risk for use of the standardized assays. And therefore, it is necessary to first undertake certain actions to wave away that risk. For example, by liaising with regulatory authorities, with key stakeholders such as laboratories, clinicians and also patients, by way of publications and meetings, by doing risk-benefit analysis at all levels of stakeholders and educate the stakeholders about the impact and changes. And when all this has been carefully prepared, then still it is very important to coordinate the implementation of the standardized and harmonized assays by all manufacturers at the same point in time and worldwide. What about the period after meteorological traceability. Well, then it is still important to control the implementation of standardization under field conditions by performing dedicated external quality assessment or PT surveys for laboratories. And in this regard, my group developed the project EmpowerIVD.globe to do so. For example, we perform dedicated EQA with native CIRA, of course. We sent a panel of native CIRA to representative laboratories for several manufacturers and we let them measure the samples and we make them different plots. We work with specifications, uh, state-of-the-art specifications, but also biological specifications for the bias. And in this way, we can visually show to the clinical community how well the landscape of establishment of traceability is and sometimes we can point to a certain manufacturer who has problems as the one here in these uh, graphs with, represented by the black triangles. It's also important to assess the sustainability of the standardization status under field conditions by working with another part of our project uh, laboratories sent us the daily medians for their outpatients. We then plot the moving median in time. The user has a user interface where they can see whether their performance is stable, as here in the left hand, the gray zone is a stability zone, or whether they have a drifting performance or a bias in performance. Also important is that manufacturers try to participate in international projects as there are, for example, the CDC Vitamin D Standardization Certification Program, which helps manufacturers to establish traceability, which also looks into the success of traceability and the sustainability of traceability. And when manufacturers succeed, well, then they are on the website of the, uh, of the CDC and this of course is valuable information for you laboratories. So now I end with asking are there success stories for standardization? Well of, co of course there are several ones such as the National Glucose Standardization Program, the National Cholesterol Education Program, the National Kidney Disease Program, we already mentioned vitamin D standardization program and of course multiple IFCC projects. So I give now the word to Dietmar who will look into the questions that you pose throughout my presentation and I will be pleased to answer them. 
Thank you, uh, Linda, for that very informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like you to remind the audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of uh, the window. Lower left of the window. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. And I will look which uh, questions have come in. But at the moment, I don't see any question for this place. So maybe I should uh, wait. Uh, so uh, I will wait a certain time whether question will appear or not. So really, I encourage the audience to, uh, to ask questions. So uh, please uh, don't fear that your question is maybe superfluous or that it is not relevant. So I, I encourage you. Still have uh, no question. So the first one, it's more uh, congratulations to us. Uh, there were several times audio breaks. So I would like to know if your presentation is recorded and for future review. Linda, I give that uh, question to you. Is it recorded for, and for future review? I think so. It will be available to the attendees of this uh, uh, webinar, I think, through Siemens. Yes, indeed, it is recorded and <coughs> it will be available later. Second question. Oh, now they come in. So, uh, uh, second question is, can you expand upon the difference between harmonization and standardization, Linda? Yes, well, harmonization is, as I said, a more pragmatic approach. Whereas standardization is a real metrological approach that works according to the concept of a reference measurement system. It makes use of reference measurement procedures of uh, patient samples assigned with values by the reference measurement procedure. So that is for SI analytes and SI traceability is established, which means that then trueness is established. In contrast, harmonization is a pragmatic approach. It is, in fact, an alignment of assays to a certain basis, but one cannot say that's the trueness. But it is an intermediary solution that makes that results are comparable. So if one day we can harmonize TSH assays, all assays will give comparable results. So another one, a very interesting one. Will every analyte be standardized eventually? Well, I think there is still a long way to go. Of course, it would be the intention to standardize every analyte, but this requires, of course, that reference measurement procedures are developed and they are very expensive. So it can either take some time or it's it will depend on how willing manufacturers are and probably also how willing laboratories are to pay for the standardization process. But of course that would be the ideal that all analytes can be standardized. On the other hand, I think that also by harmonization we can reach a lot and it's not that expensive. Another question refer to drug level measurements, for example, uh, lithium levels. So which samples should be considered for standardization? I think here is the same also for standardization of li uh, assays for measurement of lithium. One should make use of native samples assigned again a target by a reference measurement procedure. 
This question according to the slides. Can the slides be made available to the participants, please? And so on. I think we had already that questions. So uh, this slide, I think, will be available later. Then there is also a thank to Linda for the nice presentation. So I think there is no real answer that uh, you have to give, Linda. So I, I go to the next question. Could you please give an actual example, if possible, of how harmonization and standardization will work in practice? Well, in fact, both will work with a method on the basis of a method comparison where all immunoassays measure a clinically relevant panel. We then apply a recalibration to the target for that panel either set by a surrogate reference measurement procedure in case of harmonization or set by the reference measurement procedure in case of standardization. So all manufacturers will recalibrate, that means reassign the values of their master calibrators and afterwards all the assays will give comparable results. So that's the process of harmonization and standardization. Okay, uh, there is another very specific question uh, referring to 25-hydroxyvitamin uh, D standardization. Linda, could you please explain what the difference is between the CDC certification and the VDSP standardization for vitamin D? Well, there is no difference between the approaches used in both projects. They both make use of isoconform reference measurement procedures and actually the, the reference measurement procedure um, performed by my laboratory was one of the uh, reference measurement procedures used on the VDSP together with, the, with NIST. And Maybe the difference between the CDC certification program and the VDSP is that the CDC also uh, repeats the, 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 pro the process year after year because manufacturers have to prove year after year that they still are traceable to the SI uh, as defined by the reference measurement procedure. But in fact, both approaches are the same. Okay, now we have uh, specific questions referring to the uh, quality of reference measurement procedures and particularly to the uncertainty thereof. The CV, the maximum CV and the maximum bias for a reference measurement procedure, should that be compared to the biological variability? And if you could give some maximum values for those, maybe some examples for really quality specifications for reference measurement procedures, how are they developed and do we have some examples? Well, there was one slide in my presentation where I showed the model for specifications of the complete reference measurement system. So for 25-hydroxy-D, the imprecision for the routine methods is derived on the basis of the biological variation model, that's 10% and the bias for the routine assay is 5%. We then say the imprecision of the reference measurement procedure should, we, should be twice as good as the imprecision of the routine assay, thus only 5%, and the bias should consume only one-third of the bias allowable for the routine assay, thus 1.7%. Then the uncertainty of the primary calibrator used to calibrate the reference measurement procedure should be only one-third in terms of uncertainty, one-third of the bias allowable for the reference measurement procedure. So that's the principle of specifications for reference measurement procedure commensurate with the intended use and the intended use in the standardization process is, of course, establishing traceability for routine assays. Okay, uh, <clears throat> there are other questions coming in, but I think we have to wrap up. So I think we have time for one last question, which is a very important one. 
Linda, could harmonization mask deficiencies in some analytical methods? Well, there might be the possibility that harmonization uh, mask deficiencies in some analytical uh, procedures. <coughs> On the other hand, for a project for harmonization, it's also important to look beforehand in, as I said, the intrinsic quality of the uh, assays that are harmonized. So I think that currently most projects really look into that uh, uh, quality, into the limitations of the uh, assays. So I want to thank the audience for attending that uh, live webinar and also for the lively discussion afterwards. There are some remarks to be made by Dietmar regarding the availability of the uh, slides. So thank you, Linda. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing for six months from live date. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. And we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who have maybe missed that live event. So thank you all for participating. See you next, bye, next time and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.